and um, we are uh, we're good to go on that. So, well, welcome everyone uh, to our Ephesians Bible. Study. It is good to to be with all of you to to gather together back in this way. Everybody in person, study guide. I wouldn't feel them good. All right. Um, so we're meeting in a little bit different way. Uh, we're both in person and we're online. Um, and what uh, I'm so thankful that we get to have uh, in-person gathering, but we can still continue meeting together and offering this. Yeah, those are so uh, just uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, um, just some housekeeping things. Um, if you ever are uh, not able to make it in person, for those of you here and for you guys online too, uh, we're going to offer it uh, via video conferencing still. I uh, did change the platform that we're using. Uh, we moved to a Zoom platform instead of Google Meet. There's a few differences. Uh, you still click on the link, and the new link is actually on the website page uh, with that as well. So that's a background we could put in. Um, recordings will still be in the uh, Bible study page as well. Background. Um, but one of the reasons that I switched is when we do some things in person, I'm going to have you guys be able to talk with people that you're sitting near, right? We still want to maintain that safe social distancing. So thanks for wearing your masks and doing those things. Uh, but to be able to, to actually converse with one another, that's one of the benefits of gathering in person. What Zoom allows us to do is I can say, you know what, with the people gathered online, I want to split them evenly. In online uh, in groups as well. And so that's something that Zoom allows us to do that Google Meet didn't, which was one of the main reasons I wanted to switch to that so that we could get that community and relationships online as well. So uh, that's one of the reasons for that switch, uh, for, for just so everybody's on the same page with that. Um, and so uh, we're going through now Ephesians uh, for the next five or six weeks. Um, as I'm less than planning that out yet, I'm not sure if one of those weeks we'll combine two chapters or if we'll just do one chapter each week. Uh, normally, we'll be meeting upstairs in Founders Hall. Um, I, I, the added benefit there is I, uh, with trying to fill the whole room with everybody here as I get the sound system. Uh, so I don't have to project quite as loudly the whole time and save my voice a little bit. Uh, this morning, I'll just... I'll throw my voice to the wind, all right, for you, all of you. Um, but we, uh, we uh, upstairs, when I walked in this morning at about 8.20, it was 98 degrees in Founders Hall, and it was blowing hot air. So, uh, oh. so uh, we, uh, we, we just made the, talk to Matt, and he's like, well, it's probably this or this, but either way, it won't be cool enough in time for you to meet. So uh, we found the next largest available cool room. And so we're down here this morning in 102. So uh, the plan will be to be in Founders Hall again, um, but we'll be able to do that this morning. So let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together today. Thank you uh, for being our God, for watching over us, uh, even in the midst of crazy and different times. Lord, there's so much that is going on in our world, uh, in our society, and everything else. And so, Lord, we just look to you, and we ask that you would continue to sustain us, uh, to to help us to be faithful to your word, to your calling, uh, to, to love and to share and to extend grace and peace to others. So, uh, Lord, I just ask that you would guide our study today and be with us as we uh, live and serve and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What I'd like you to do uh, here is just with uh, people that are around, you don't need to move your chairs, but maybe turn your bodies a little bit. Um, maintain as much social distancing as you can. Uh, groups of two or three or four, uh, depending on how many are right around you. Uh, just share on this following question. Who is someone that extended peace or grace to you? And how did you do that? And I'm going to split you guys into groups here. Uh, and so you guys will do the same thing online. Uh, who is someone that extended grace and peace to you? And then I'll bring you back uh, when we're done with that at the end. So here we go. So you should have an invitation to join a room. Go ahead and join that room. It'll bring you back here once you close out of that room. So just click join room, Lois, and it should take you to uh, a room with uh, Michelle Penrod. Uh, 
I got there. All right, we're going to take about uh, another minute and then we'll uh, come on back together. Just, just going to review a little bit of that. We're not going to read everything there, but. The street being the GNC, but yeah. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Yeah. Never been there. Yeah. Welcome back. We're back. <laughs> did that work? Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Yeah, it worked. It did. Right. Yes. So I, I think that adds a, another dynamic to uh, in another community element there. So hopefully that works for us. We'll do the same near the end um, and for some of our discussion time too. So uh, if you guys have questions or, or comments while we're going, uh, either type them in the chat box or just kind of wave at me and I'll, I'll be looking down periodically just to check in with you guys and uh, you can unmute and, and jump in and uh, and, and ask your questions that way too and i'll repeat them for the whole group so yeah thank you all right so let's uh, gather back together uh it's good to talk to other people isn't it <laughs> yes <laughs> to be able to share and talk with other people uh maybe other than the people that live in your if you're living with other people in your home other than them um and so just uh just glad to be able to fellowship and do that together um, and hopefully that was an extension of grace and peace to you just by having that conversation um, as we go through that too as well. So um, we're going to talk through uh, the book of Ephesians. We're going to start out with a lot of um, what's called the isagogics. It's, it means like, what is the book about? Where did it come from? Who wrote it? All of those background pieces. When was it written? Who was it written to? All of that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we're going to get through chapter one today as well. So that's the game plan, uh, the roadmap for today. So um, where is Ephesus? I printed off a, a little map on the study guide uh, as you're going here. And so if you're looking, uh, this little uh, kind of peninsula over here is not very little. It's actually, this is modern day Turkey, kind of cut in half. What's on the right side of the map is modern day Turkey. What's on the left side of your map, that's modern day Greece. Okay, so um, uh, Ephesians, uh, Ephesus, I should say, who the book of Ephesians was written to. Uh, is right uh, kind of in the middle of the coast of Turkey. So right about uh, right about there on, on the map for you guys there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's modern, uh, so that's Ephesus. Um, it's a port city. Uh, it's, 
Yeah, so it's right there on the port um, on the west coast of, of what's called Asia Minor, often in biblical times. Modern day Turkey is often called Asia Minor. Um, it was a center of trade and commerce uh, in the ancient world. Uh, it was one of the important cities in Asia Minor. Uh, there's some minor cities in Asia Minor, but this was one of the major ones. So um, that's, the, that's where Ephesus is, and people who lived in Ephesus were called Ephesians. And so Paul writes this book uh, to the saints in Ephesus. And so those who believe in Jesus are saints. And so he's writing it to the church, to the Christians in Ephesus. This would not have been one singular church. It wouldn't have been a building that he's writing to. It was uh, pockets of house churches and places, not only in Ephesus, but in that area surrounding Ephesus. So he'd have been writing to all of these Christians in Ephesus, and they'd have circulated his letter around between all of these groups as he wrote to them. Okay. Um, so I just want to look and see some of the things that we know about Ephesus. We're going to look back at the um, book of Acts. We're not going to necessarily read every single verse uh, in these chapters in Acts, uh, but this is what we learn and know about Acts. If you were with our study a couple years ago and we did Acts, this may be familiar. If you've never studied Acts, uh, then this will be brand new, and that's okay too. So um, let's go to Acts chapter 18. And so just for context for everybody, um, Paul, who wrote the book of Ephesians, uh, he had done, uh, he comes into play um, in Acts chapter 7 and 8, and and then he disappears for a little bit and then comes back into play in, in uh, Acts chapter 11, 12, something like that. And he begins doing these missionary journeys. Uh, and he travels uh, first through, Asia, through parts of Asia Minor on the first one. Uh, on the second one, he goes to Macedonia and Greece. And on the way back, he kind of just uh, glances by Ephesus just briefly. But then to, uh, as part of his third missionary journey, he spends a couple years, uh, almost three years, in the, in the city of Ephesus. It's one of the places he actually spent the longest. So let's just uh, kind of review some of those things in, in Acts chapter 18, verses 18 through 21. Can somebody just read those verses just to get us started? We're not going to read every verse that I have down here, but I want to start by reading those. Can somebody... Uh, go ahead, Rusty. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off in Sintra. He came a vow he had taken. They arrived in Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogues and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he sent sail from Ephesus. All right, good. So this is Paul's kind of first uh, first journey to Ephesus is uh, on the way back. Like he's trying to get back to Jerusalem. <laughs> he wants to get back and to, see, uh, to Syria, to Antioch, to report on the second missionary journey with Silas about how it went to preaching in Macedonia and in Greece. Uh, and so he wants to get back. So he stops in Ephesus and he leaves kind of his uh, com traveling companions Aquila and Aquila. Uh, he leaves them. Um, he leaves them there in um, in Ephesus to kind of be church planners, to work with the people in Ephesus, the Christians there. But you notice he goes to the synagogue, to where the Jews were gathered, and he begins to talk about Jesus. They want him to stay longer. They want him to hear more about this, and to, um, but he he refuses. He says, "I need to get back, but if it's God's will, I'll come back and be with you all again." Uh, and that's the first kind of part of that. At the end, uh, and then it transitions, and this guy named Apollos comes into Ephesians uh, and is preaching. He's, well, he's a gifted speaker. He's knowledgeable in the Old Testament, but his Christ he knows of Jesus, but his knowledge of Jesus is limited. And so he hooks up with Priscilla and Aquila, and they kind of teach him a little bit more. He's a much gift more gifted speaker, it seems, uh, but they know much more about it. And so there's this mentorship and this okay. partnership that Long. Sounds good. Thank you very much, but, Tony. Bye-bye. Uh, he, uh, he goes and gets them, uh, and they work together, and he's in Ephesus for all teaching and preaching. Then he goes and he leaves and heads over to Macedonia, right as Paul's coming back. Right? And so he and Apollos don't necessarily connect with each other, 
uh, but Paul's coming back, and that's in verse 19, where Paul gets there, and he, um, he gets to Ephesus. This is the 19, and they have an incomplete Christianity. They know about Jesus, but they haven't experienced or heard about the Holy Spirit. And so uh, he teaches them about the Holy Spirit. He prays they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What that looked like before and after, we don't know 100% for sure. But that's what's uh, going on in the first part of, of, of Ephesians. And then he continues to teach and preach there. Um, and it tells us he's basically there for two and a half more years. So uh, with the time that he sent originally in there, he's there almost three years. So this is no kind of fly-by-night operation for Paul. He knows these people intimately. He's lived with them. He's taught with them. Uh, he's probably shed blood and tears with them as they've gone about their lives and working and trying to be part of uh, and learning Christianity and being part of the church. And so that's what's going on in Ephesus. Paul knows them intimately, I think is what we should know and understand. Um, at the end of verse or chapter 18 or 19, excuse me, the other thing, the major event that happens there is we learn that it's not all daisies and roses for Paul in Ephesus. He's been there a while. It's been a fruitful and productive ministry, but not everyone likes Paul and Christianity. At the end, there's uh, this riot that develops because there's these, uh, the silversmiths, you know, the, the guild of silversmiths, uh, there, because of the spread of Christianity, which says, don't sacrifice to idols, they're worthless beings, they're creatures, they're empty, they're not worth uh, paying money or homage or worship to, this message of Christianity is spreading, and it's being, becoming popular not only in Ephesus, but it's spreading throughout Asia Minor. And because of that, the silversmith's business is hit a major recession. They're losing money. They're losing business because of Christianity. Because people aren't buying their household idols and gods and trinkets to worship to or to take home with them as a souvenir to, to worship and pay homage to at their homes. And so there's a riot that develops in Ephesus. Um, and they fill the whole theater, basically. You know, probably 10 to 20,000 people could fit in the theater is what I've heard. Um, and they fill the whole theater and they shout. Uh, somebody tries to get up and speak at one point in time. And I think it says in Acts that they shouted for four hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Because Artemis was the god. I mean, so this is oh, the goddess, the, the patron goddess there. Ar great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Paul wanted to get up on stage and he's like, I've got a captive audience here. They'll listen, right? But uh, not only did his fellow traveling companions, but even the leader that were friends of Paul that he'd gotten to know over the last three years, they said, no way, you can't do it. And they, they, they restrained him. They kept him from going up on him because they thought he would be killed. And he might have been. Um, that very likely, very plausible, very possible that way. And so uh, they send so, uh, the the rival party, the Jews don't like Paul, so they send somebody up on stage, but they shout him off the stage. Um, and eventually the governor gets them to disperse um, um, because they're in danger of rioting. <coughs> Very free, independent city, and they didn't want to lose that status. And so they end up dispersing, and Paul then moves on from there. Um, and then we get to uh, verse, verse 20. Paul moves on from there. He goes back to Macedonian Greece. And then he's coming back. This is the end of his third missionary journey. Uh, he's already kind of had these thoughts and feelings from the Holy Spirit that he's that things are going to be changing for him. You know, it's on the whole way back. It's like you're going to Paul. You're going to be imprisoned if you go up to Jerusalem. Probably, you know. So whether or not he had those things or thoughts or, or feelings already at this point, um, he makes one last journey towards Ephesus. He doesn't want to go back to Ephesus because. Um, he knows if he does that it won't be a short journey. It won't be a short trip. You know, maybe you've experienced that too. Well, if I go and I start a conversation here, I know it's going to be another half an hour, right? <laughs> I really need to get going. I need to get home. Um, and so Paul says, uh, I'm just going to drive by, roll down the window, and we'll talk for a minute, and then I'm going to get going. <laughs> he goes to a different coastal city, 
he sends messengers to Ephesus to have some of the leaders come down and meet him there. That sets that kind of drive by. And he, and he gives this farewell prayer and address for them. And in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 20, um, he doesn't know if he'll see them again. And, and so that's what's going on in Acts chapter 20. So he has a heart for these people. <clears throat> he has a, a real deep personal and spiritual connection with them. So this kind of gives me that flavor of the connection between Paul. When he starts to speak to the Ephesians, he knows them. And they know him really, really, really well. Okay. Um, and so that, that's what's going on there. We, we hear of Ephesians a couple other times uh, in, the, in, in the Bible. Uh, so let's jump to Revelation chapter 2. So in Revelation, uh, in Revelations, it's written to seven churches uh, in Asia Minor. John is the, the author as he writes down his vision. Um, Ephesus is one of these cities. It's actually the first one that kind of is, is listed there. Um, to the church in Ephesus, in Revelation 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, written, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found themselves to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you first had. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, so there's these admonitions to all of these different churches. Um, most of them have a, a balance to them. You guys are doing great here. You're really messing up here, right? There's most of them have that kind of balance that are going on. There's, there's one that's almost all good and there's one that's almost all bad, but most of the churches have that balance in these addresses. And so what is it that the Ephesians are doing good? Did you catch that? So they're, they're persevering, they're keeping on. And part of that persevering was even um, holding up against false teachers, right? Um, they're, they're continuing not just in, in faith, but they're continuing the truth of their faith in uh, false teachers. And what's, what's kind of the knock against the Ephesians? They abandon their first love. Um, it's kind of become, um, they've let their love grow cold. They're not loving each other like they first did. They're not caring for each other's needs as they first did. They're not caring for the needs of those around them as they first did. Their love has grown cold. They've abandoned that love, that excitement they had for the faith and sharing that with others. That's grown cold. And the call is to repent. At the same time, it says, hey, you're not, you're not joining the Nicolaitans, which uh, the Nicolaitans were, uh, I, the, they're a group of folks that uh, would, uh, engage in sexual immorality and said that was okay as Christians. Um, and they were a group of people that said also eating meat sacrificed to other idols and participating in their altars was okay as Christians. And, and so he's like, you, you rejected them. That's good. But you've lost your love. Your love for me and your love for others. Um, and so that's part in the background here of Ephesians. This uh, revelation was written after the book of Ephesians. There would have been uh, several years, if not decades, between the book of Ephesians and Revelation. But you can see some of that thread, maybe that goes throughout of the things they were really good at in Paul's day. They were still really good at in John's day when he was writing down the book of Revelation, his vision. You know, and maybe some of the things they struggled with a little bit <clears throat> in Paul's day as he's writing Ephesians, you know, to love one another. There's admonitions, uh, especially about unity amongst their brothers and sisters in Christ. That they were struggling with that unity that they were. Yeah, go ahead, Mom. 
Yeah, yes. So the question was, did John have a personal relationship with these seven churches? Um, yes. Um, and, and specifically, if you look down at uh, 4B, where it's like according to Eusebius there, or the second part of there, according to Eusebius, uh, Eusebius was the father of church history. Um, so usually if you study any kind of church history, you hear two names often. According to Josephus, right, Josephus is a, he was a Jewish historian, not a Christian, but he was a Jewish historian, and, and we know a lot of what we know about first century uh, Palestine, Israel, because of Josephus. The other, the other one is according to Eusebius. Eusebius was a church father. He was a Christian um, in the uh, late 200s, early 300s, I believe. And he took a lot of the, um, a lot of the church writings and letters and other things, and he wrote histories, uh, basically transcribing large portions of these other things into his works. In fact, if it weren't for Eusebius, we wouldn't have many of the works of earlier church fathers because they're only recorded in, Joseph, in Eusebius. They weren't, uh, the rest of the originals and any copies were destroyed that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. He should be. But you look at that of churches that they have a pastor for three years or 30 years, and they don't have a pastor for a little bit, and they struggle. You know, and not that Paul had set them up without pastors. So according to Josephus, I didn't finish that. According to Eusebius, sorry, I didn't finish my train of thought. I got off a little bit. Um, according to Eusebius, uh, John, um, this is James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Um, according to John, or according to Eusebius, John, later settled in Ephesus, became the leader of the church in Ephesus. And so John had a personal relationship with the church in Ephesus, but because of that, would have had relationships with all the churches in Asia Minor. Um, his church historians kind of piece it together this way. Um, on the cross, Jesus told John to do what? Or he, what did he tell John on the cross? He said, behold your mother, behold your son, to his mom. And so tradition goes, and this is tradition, this isn't in scripture, right? But tradition goes that John did exactly that. Uh, when other of the disciples, the apostles spread out and took the message elsewhere, John remained in Judea taking care of Mary until she died. After she died, he ended up in Ephesus and, and really remained there as much as he was able to when he wasn't exiled to Patmos and other things. But Ephesus was his home base where he was really the bishop, the father, the leader uh, of the church there in that area. Yeah. Yeah, Ken. Uh, the the uh, traditional site of his burial is in Ephesus, I believe. That's correct, Ken. You would probably know better than me. I know you've been there. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the traditional site uh, of his burial is in Ephesus, and that's remembered there and, and all that as well. Yeah, Carolyn? Yeah. So, so yeah, if, if, if Brighton says the revelation, you take it, you take it. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so Carolyn, just for the folks online, I'm going to re repeat that. Carolyn just shared that uh, in a class with Lewis Brighton, who uh, wrote the book on Revelation, literally. Um, just that he said that they lost their first love. They lost that enthusiasm they had when they first began to follow, and it just became down into the nitty gritty, the minutia, the the this, the stuff, the tasks, instead of about the love and the enthusiasm they had when they first started following Jesus. So. Yeah, mom. Fast forward to now, what is the change that Ken, I don't know if you can speak to that. The, the question was about the Christian presence in that area. My understanding is it's not very strong, if anybody. Yeah, it, it's a Muslim country. If there are Christians, it's very much underground. I don't even think, like in Egypt, you have the Coptic church. I don't even think that there's much of any presence there. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Yeah, Ken just said the, the ancient city of Ephesus is really just a ruin. Uh, the people that are in that area now are, are pretty much Muslim. And that's my understanding, too, is uh, pretty much in all of Turkey. Um, there's not a, there's not a, the church is not in a visible way. There's still the individual church and underground churches is what I understand and some movements that are there, um, but not much in a visible public church. They're persecuted, very much so. Very, very much so. Yeah. 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 So, um, so the, the idea there that uh, we mean that those Christians, if they're, they're persecuted. So if you're a Christian in, and known to be a Christian in Turkey, um, you can be jailed or killed or worse. Whether that's sanctioned officially by the government or not, it's allowed to happen. Um, your family can be abused, uh, tortured, um, and, you know, whether the government officially looks the other way, there's not much that's usually done about it. Um, so, and these were, these are, again, these were places where the church was born and grew and our, there are roots are there, but yet uh, how things can change in that. Sylvia. Yeah. Now that so, the again. Yeah. And so it was, yeah. <coughs> yeah, it still was this comment on the Hagia Sophia um, in um, you know, Istanbul, Constantinople yeah, yeah. area. The, the big uh, iconic uh, building that you see if you've seen pictures of that. It was a, a church called Hagia Sophia. Um, it was a museum and they're turning oh. it into a mosque. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, all right. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Alan just commented is that you know a lot of churches today can struggle with the same idea of losing their first love, uh, and that we can get caught up so much in uh, even good things like traditions and practices and, and those things that we aren't reaching out with the love of Christ and with the joy and passion that maybe we once had. And I don't think there, I don't think it's a zero sum. I don't think it's one or the other. I think you can do both, but I think we focus so much on the one out. And I'd agree with you that we've sometimes have lost our true love of, of loving and caring for others. Yeah. There, there is a, uh, Alan just made the comment or observation that, but sometimes folks that join uh, and become Christians later in life, they have a different zeal or enthusiasm that, that maybe some of us have lost or, or struggled to have. <laughs> and I, I've seen that too of, of new Christians that have lived without that or people that have been away from the church. When they come back, they have a, a renewed zeal and joy and enthusiasm, uh, a love that's there. And uh, that doesn't mean we have to fall away to gain that back. <laughs> But it's how do we spark that love and joy again? And that was what the call was to the church in Ephesus. And I think you'll see some of that in Paul's letter to them already. Uh, it's not quite the same, but we'll see that in Paul's letter as we go today. All right. Um, just a couple other things here. Um, who else did ministry to Ephesus? And you can see First Timothy 1 verse 3. That should give you a clue as to who else did ministry in Ephesus. Yeah. Timothy. Yeah, Paul basically, uh, uh, Paul basically sent Timothy to go be a pastor in Ephesus because they were struggling with some false teachers, All right? So Rusty, you're saying, how could they fall away? Well, there's other people that are coming in and not everybody does things the right way. And so Paul at one point sent Timothy there. And by the time they got to John, Timothy's teaching and preaching had definitely taken root and held because they were now able to defend against these false teachers well. So Timothy's ministry seemingly was very effective from that point of view because they were able to hold fast that way. Well, that's why we, we continue to have uh, pastors and, and teachers and, and all of us. Well, one of, the, one of my favorite verses about ministry is in Ephesians, and we'll get to that in a couple weeks. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the idea is 
is there are apostles and there are teachers that God has sent to equip the saints for the works of ministry, not to do ministry, not to be the only ones that are there. It's not, okay, we got pastor. He can do everything now. No, pastor is there to equip all of us to have that love and that joy, extend that grace and that mercy and that peace to others, right? That's the purpose. That's the point, not just to, not to do things, but to equip the saints. Uh, and that's one of my favorite uh, passages for how ministry is to be. Yeah, Carolyn. That's kind of how I feel about my career. Half of my career is exactly how I feel. Because I was working for a And then I went to and other Yeah. Yeah, you're equipping them for the works of ministry. Yeah, Carolyn's talked about her career of uh, teaching and, and working with children and then moving to uh, equipping and, and teaching teachers. And, and that's, that's what our, you know, some are called to be pastors and some to be teachers and some to be like, but the goal, the point is to equip the saints. Uh, that's what we're called to do and to be. So uh, I'll pause there. I haven't heard from anybody online yet. Do you have any questions, comments, thoughts? I'll, I'll, I'll break there and pause. I'm seeing head shaking no at this point, but uh, if, if anybody has anything, uh, we're good. Okay. Uh, pausing there. Is, is that helpful the way I'm repeating back questions? Am I doing yes. that well enough for you guys? It's okay. perfect. Great, great. All right. Um, all right. So the major themes in uh, question number five, the major themes in Ephesians, uh, I mentioned it earlier. One of them is unity uh, to the church being together, of not being pulled apart or faction or fractured. Um, that has to do with that love for one another. Uh, the other couple other major themes is Paul continually talks about baptism in Ephesians, and he also talks about prayer. So those are some of the major themes that happen throughout the book of Ephesians. And then question six was, when was this book written? Um, in Galatians 3.1, Paul says um, that he's a prisoner. So that gives us a clue into the timing of when this was written. So we had that where he came down and did that drive by the leaders came down and he, he, he waved farewell to them, had a prayer and, and, and then went on. He went back to Jerusalem at that point. And while he was in Jerusalem, uh, the Jews tried to ambush him and kill him. Um, and they tried to do it then through the Romans. Um, and Paul basically was under house arrest for his own protection from the Jews. Um, he was on trial a couple different times in front of the Roman governors. And they said, and a new one came and said, well, let's go back to Jerusalem and we can have the trial there. Well, Paul's like, no, that's a trap for me to go back there to where they're going to kill me in route or while I'm there where they control the city more. And so that's when Paul appeals to Caesar. Uh, as a Roman citizen, he had that right. Just like we can appeal to a, an appellate court or to a higher court all the way to the Supreme Court if we are able, right? Uh, Paul was able to appeal his case to Caesar. Um, and so as a, he was still a prisoner. Uh, but then he went from Caesarea Maritima in Judea and was taken to Rome, where he was in, under house arrest there. So we're not a, uh, there are scholars debate on, on where exactly he was, but sometime during those uh, two or three year period where he was in prison, either in Judea or in Rome, uh, was when he would have written uh, this letter, when he was a prisoner. Uh, he is later acquitted. He stands trial. He's acquitted. He's able to do a fourth missionary journey and travel around a little bit more. Uh, and then he's imprisoned again. Uh, but this seems to be the first imprisonment that he has, um, either in Judea or in Rome, that he is writing this letter to the Ephesians. So um, that's, that's what's going on um, and when. So uh, around, uh, his, he was first arrested in 58 AD. And so this would probably have been written sometime around 60 AD. Um, is very likely when that goes. So, um, so that's the that's the background. Any other questions on the background of Ephesus and Ephesians of who Paul is writing to? And he's writing to the Christians in this part. Yeah, go ahead. So, unity, baptism, and prayer are the major themes. This is a question to read at the major themes there. Yeah. Unity, baptism, and prayer are some of the major things. Not that he doesn't talk about other things, too, um, but those, those three uh, are the major themes. 
Um, Paul, I believe, I think the traditional death date of Paul is around 65 to 67. Yeah. That, that, again, that's not from scripture, that's from tradition. But, uh, yeah, that, um, I, from my understanding, Paul was not alive, uh, in AD 70 when the, when Jerusalem, well, that was the question, was Paul alive when, when Jerusalem would have fallen? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, where did Paul go after his first imprisonment in Rome and then the second one? So the first imprisonment was more of a house arrest. It was a, uh, you got an ankle bracelet on Paul. Uh, don't, don't leave the city, uh, but you can have anybody you want to uh, come and, and be with you. And just your, you have a guard that just needs to stay in the house with you. That was his ankle bracelet. Right, you know, but it was that kind of idea. Um, he wasn't a flight risk. He wasn't seen as seditious or uh, someone who was going to stir up to people. His second arrest um, was where um, tradition has it he was thrown into the, the maritime jail, which was an awful place to be, um, and it was not pleasant for him at all. Um, tradition uh, has that he, you know, kind of made this for, you know this journey maybe back to some places in Greece or Asia Minor. He desired to go to Tarsus, to Spain, um, and so some traditions say that he did go there, um, and some say that he didn't. Um, and so, uh, but he continued to travel and to preach and to teach. And so th those are what the traditions kind of tell us about Paul. Yeah, good. Any other thoughts or questions about uh, the background to Ephesus? Um, to the Ephesian, the book of Ephesians about Ephesus or about Paul or about the, the things that are there. The reason that we talk about those things is uh, these words that are in scripture were not written in a vacuum. They were, they were inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. The writers were real people who had their own unique vocabulary which the Holy Spirit used to convey thoughts and words to a real audience who had their own issues and struggles and cultures that are there. And so for us to understand who it was that wrote them and what occasion and people they were writing to helps us to understand the context and the meanings of the words that the Holy Spirit was using the author to write down. And so that's why we, we look at those things about who writ, wrote it and to whom and to, to and why and where. Um, to understand and unpack a little bit more the context and the depth of those words which the Holy Spirit used to write down, not only for the Ephesians, but for us today too. So, all right. So let's dive now into, uh, let's dive into um, Ephesians uh, chapter 1. Uh, verses 1 and 2. Somebody be willing to read that for us. Yeah, go ahead, Carol. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Great. So this is Paul's greeting. If you didn't hear that online, just the, those verses 1 and 2. This is Paul's greeting. Um, and how does this uh, follow the conventions of ancient letter writing in a greeting? You had who it was from. Is that how Paul starts? So he says, Paul, and he gives his credentials, right? An apostle, a sent one of Christ Jesus by Paul's will because Paul wanted to? Because God willed it, right? So he's even saying his authority there, where his authority comes from. It comes from God. I've been sent by God. That's who I am, All right? So that's the, who's it from? And then you have the address. Who's it to? Is that what Paul does next? Yeah. To the saints who are in Ephesus. This is to the, the ones who are made holy. Right? That's what saint means, is to be holy or, made, or to be made holy. To those who are holy you know, in Ephesus and who are faithful in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus. So that's that address. He's saying this is who it's to. It's not to non-Christians. It's not to un-Christians. It's not to, to uh, just anybody. It's to the saints, to those who are made holy. So 
I always find this comforting when I read the letters of, of Paul, um, is that he addresses it to saints. Now, did they have everything right? Mm -hmm. But are they still saints? And I always find that comforting to know that even though I may not have everything right, I'm still a saint too because of what Jesus has done, even if I don't get everything right all the time. And I find that comforting to know like when, like the Corinthians, they were way messed up, but, but Paul still calls them saints because they still had Jesus, because Jesus still had them. Yeah. And so that's who it's to, the address. And then there's a greeting. Does Paul do that? Yes. And what's the greeting Paul says? Grace to you. Grace to you and peace. peace. And so that's why I had to start out with who are people that God has used to extend grace and peace to you, right? Sometimes they may not even know it or know they're being agents of God, but God's still using them to extend grace and peace. That's what Paul wanted for the Ephesians. Grace, peace. Uh, I think every book that Paul writes, that's how he starts. And it's pretty much how he finishes too. Grace and peace. You know, and we think about that grace, that's undeserved love and kindness. Peace, that's shalom, that's well-being, that's being right with God, right? That not just an absence of conflict, but uh, a well-being, a rightness with, with God that's there. Uh, uh, a calmness in the midst of, of, the, of the roiling and boiling and struggle of life. Grace and peace. Thoughts, comments, questions? So often uh, pastors will start our messages with uh, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and often that's that way, not because we're making something up or somebody else made something up, but because we're quoting Paul. As Paul addressed Christians, uh, so often that's how our pastors, how we'll start a message as we address fellow saints. Sometimes it's grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it's we're extending that same, that's the desire. What we want for you in our message is for you to experience God's grace and peace. Um, and, and we are trying to be those agents of grace, peace into your lives too. So, yeah, that was often how messages started. Um, the liturgy was, was there, and, and that's just a convention, a tradition that's, that often is said or spoken. Other, other thoughts or, or questions or comments? Yeah, it turns focus to God, Elaine, is what Elaine's comment was. It, it turns that back to God. No matter what else we're struggling with, it turns that focus to God and what he gives. And so this uh, Paul's greeting there is the same. Um, how is this the greeting of grace and peace that we can extend to others? How do we extend grace and peace to others? Yeah. <laughs> so there, there was a sign of peace yeah. or a passing of the peace. Um, yeah, uh, and um, in the old, old days in Scripture, it was greet each other with a holy kiss, right? So that, that, was, the, that was there, um, and then that got translated into hugs or handshakes, and, and right not now, it's not right, it's, it's either elbows or waves or nods, right? Yeah. But it's that idea of, of greeting one another. Um, there's something to a that physical eye contact and connection with other people, um, whether we're actually touching others or not. There's that connection that we get to have. Peace. Yeah, Sylvia. Yeah. Yeah. 
and Sylvia was just sharing just how at this time during COVID-19, we're not able to, to share that physical touch and, and speak and communicate through that physical touch um, like we used to be able to do. Uh, and that can be very isolating uh, in this time. Carolyn. One thing that I think is really interesting that's along this line is that even though COVID is very isolating, I find Yeah, Carolyn was just sharing just even though it's isolating physically that uh, it's opened up doors for her to have conversations with people that she might not have before the people in the aisle at the grocery store or the grocery store clerk and now you know them and you're talking with them and and right. able to have that opportunity to extend grace and peace to them through that too. Yeah, go ahead, mom, and then Russell. Another thing that seems like it's been that resurrection during this time has been the written word. People have taken time to write notes and write an email that they might not have bothered to do before waiting for the email or whatever. Sometimes that written word from another person is something to keep going back to it. So just uh, the comment was just that the written word uh, has been increasing during this time too. Uh, just maybe we're taking more time for conversations, but also to, to write a, a note or to send an email, uh, which can be so encouraging for people as well. Yeah, Rusty. Jesus didn't have to do with this virus. They, they wouldn't have one when he was walking. Then suppose Jesus was living the day. How would he handle this virus? Well, they they didn't yeah they didn't have this virus, but they had leprosy. You know, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> they had leprosy, um, which was even more isolating than than this. If you were suspected to have leprosy or had leprosy, you had to immediately pack up and go to a leper colony. Uh, where even the other lepers didn't want to be around you. Um, and so what did Jesus do? Jesus went in right where they were and touched them and healed them, right? Now, we're not Jesus, and we don't have necessarily that power that he's given to us all the time or even at all. Um, and, and so, but Jesus got down in the mess is what Jesus did. Um, and so I, I think the church, in a safe and responsible way as much as possible, we need to get down in the mess, you know, um, and bring healing. Now, it might not be physical healing that Jesus brought, but we have a healing, a peace, and a grace that we can extend to. Yeah. Yeah. It might be, Linda just was asking and commenting on how um, during this time, there's so many different reactions and thoughts about masks and how we respond or how we react that some people, everybody's more on edge and more irritable. And that's not just been Linda's experience. It's been more the opposite is what Linda was saying. And, and so um, I think I think it's going to depend some, like you were saying, on what we dwell on and what we focus on, on who's our anchor or what's our anchor in the midst of that. Um, and so just to kind of bring it back full circle here, in the midst of whatever's going on in our lives, whether it's a, a virus, a COVID crisis, isolation, uh, whether it's civil unrest, whether it's disagreements in families, what, whatever it is, what's our call as Christians or to be agents of grace and peace? We're to extend grace and peace. That doesn't mean we like what's going on around us necessarily. It doesn't even mean we necessarily agree with what's going on around us. But as God's men and women were to do what Paul did and what he called the Christians to do in Ephesus to extend grace and peace. 
that's yeah. Our, yeah. Uh, yes, it's Ruth. Um, when you are working with people and we all have them around us, the people without God in their life and knowing him do not really have grace and peace. This is, I, I met a gentleman over my weekend that six lessons with one of the false teachings disrupted his life for many, many years. It, it put such confusion in until a Christian sat down and helped him understand faith. And he's now made it his um, life's passion that when they come to the front door, he has prepared all sorts of things to teach them, <laughs> uh, to work with them, to help them hear about the truth and, and God and, and, you know, what faith is all about. And a very dynamic gentleman in his life now. Yeah, I think that Ruth was just saying just the, that's something that non-Christians don't necessarily have is grace and peace. Um, and, and how we can get so messed up ourselves or others can get so messed up with other messages or other things that it can put our lives in downward spirals. Um, you know, as Christians, I think so often we, we thought, and this maybe goes back to this love idea, you know, that we were talking about earlier that the Ephesians kind of had lost their first love. I think so often uh, we, we have the truth and we need to give people the truth because we've got the truth. Is that true? Yes. It's true, yeah. But is that the only thing that we have? We have grace and peace. And if we're trying to give truth without grace and peace, it's not going to be heard. You know, and so often, Paul doesn't even talk about truth until a couple chapters later. But what does he start with? He starts with grace and peace. And that's what, you know, for me, as I, as I look at life, it's, how do I enter into relationships with others where I can extend grace and peace so that I can gain a hearing for the truth? So often we start with the truth and never get around to the grace and peace and nobody ever hears us. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and uh, Linda Ray just said, as in this conversation, important to reach out to those that are experiencing additional stress right now. Uh, because there are those, as I think, Linda, you're kind of referring to the there are definitely those people around us that have that. So we need to make sure we're reaching out and caring for people in that way too. All right, let's keep going on. Um, um, through whom has God blessed us? So we need to read, sorry, we need to read verses uh, three through 10. And I'll go ahead and read that one right now. So, uh, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us, in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things to him, things in heaven and things on earth. So, through whom has God blessed us? Christ Jesus, right? It's the Sunday school answer, right? It's the right answer to it. It's Jesus, right? Through Jesus, he has blessed us. Um, and, and what are some of those ways that through Jesus, he's blessed us? How? How has God blessed us through Christ? What has he given to us? What are some things that Paul mentions here uh, in this section of chapter one? We're adopted as sons. And again, uh, we looked at that in Galatians. That doesn't mean men. He adopted us as heirs is what we mean by that, that we have the full rights as those who will inherit the things God has. We're adopted as heirs. That's what that word sons means as we looked at that in Galatians. All right, so we're adopted. We're part of the family with all the rights and privileges. We talked about, too, an adoption in this day and age that couldn't be undone, right? You could disown your natural-born child, but if you chose to adopt someone, they were yours no matter what. 
is you made the choice to adopt, right? So this is a permanent thing. This is God saying, you're mine. I'm not going back on this. Other things God gives. Spiritual blessings. And so we could, name, we could list some of those off, the fruits of the spirit or forgiveness or peace or grace. Yeah, Carolyn. Yeah, so uh, Carolyn was sharing with us not only how, um, this is we were talking earlier, their, their knowledge was incomplete, the, the Ephesians. Paul is sharing very much uh, how these blessings of God come to us through each part of the Trinity. In the first part, if you look at it, it talks about how God the Father has blessed us. And then it talks about how Jesus has blessed us. And then in the last section, if you go on in 13 and 14, it even talks about how the Holy Spirit uh, continues to bless us and be with us. And so you see the Trinity are right in here as Paul is writing and teaching uh, with them and to them. Thanks for that, Carolyn. Yeah. And other things. Forgiveness. Redeemed us. Yeah. There is one on the cross. Forgiveness is there. Linda, thank you. Yeah. Regarding the Holy Spirit. Yeah. He is our yeah. guarantee. We are sealed with the promise Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of our inheritance. Yeah. And so just jumping ahead to the Holy Spirit, that section, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but Richard's right. It, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee, our seal. It's a done deal, right? Because the Holy Spirit's with us. Do you have the Holy Spirit, by the way? <laughs> oh, yes. Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Yes. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. It's given through our baptism. Uh, we have, you have the Holy Spirit. He is the seal, the guarantee. The fact that you're in this room or in this virtual room <laughs> means that you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in you and through you to learn and to grow and to strengthen your faith. Uh, you have the Holy Spirit. Yeah, good. Um, so what's God's plan? Right that, At the end, uh, oh, one other thing, just as we're thinking about what God's given us, um, Paul uses this word predestined us. Right. And a lot of times, like, I don't know, like if you come across that or you're trying to talk with other people and you're like, oh, man, I don't want to talk about that because I don't fully get it. Right. But when whenever it's used in scripture, when predestination is talked about in scripture, it's it's a single predestination. God is choosing you for salvation. That doesn't mean in our this is where our brains can't comprehend because immediately goes, well, does that mean he picks some to go to hell? No. Right. Predestination election is another way to talk about that is something that brings you and me comfort uh, richard it goes to what you were saying with that guarantee or that seal god has chosen you that's what we know that's what we can speak to we, we don't go the other way um right calvinists do double but we don't go the other way because that's again it's not necessarily helpful and that's not how scripture speaks scripture speaks of predestination and election as a comfort for christians did God choose me? Am I okay? Right? Can we answer that question? Yeah, that's what predestination election. Yes, he chose you from the before the foundation of the world to be his child, and he saved you in Jesus Christ. You can take you to the bank every time. Done. Signed, sealed, delivered. Right? It's a song or something, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're the lords in that. Um, it's a guarantee. Um, just a note. Yeah, it's, uh, and just, uh, so that's, that's when we talk about that. See that as a, this is a strength in the faith, a guarantee. We don't have to wonder or question uh, about our faith or about our status with God. He has chosen. That's when we see predestined or election. That's what that's talking about. Um, Linda Ray said that she loved how we're reminded that his grace is not just given to us, but it's lavished. It's, uh, it, it's uh, 
above and beyond. Over and above, yeah. It's exorbitant, over and above, right? It's, um, it, it's, it's not just a little bit, but it's over the top, lavished on us. Okay. Um, and then it talks about God's plan, right? To make known the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, that he set forth in plan, as a plan for the fullness of time. So what is God's plan that Paul's talking about here uh, in, in verse 10 there? So, yeah, his plan to save the world, to save you and to save me. Uh, it's his plan of salvation um, in the fullness of time, right? Um, and that's God's timing. Um, so how does remembering who we are and what we've received from God's plan help center our lives? How does remembering those things help center our lives on Christ? So we remember our, that's one of the ways we do that is remembering our baptism, but what does that do for us? How does that help us? When we think about those things, when we focus on those things, how does that help us? Yeah, Alan. So it's understanding our place. Alan's just kind of saying this. Uh, we understand our place as he's his creator. We are a creature. And it helps us to trust in him for all good things uh, that he has given and will continue to give. Yeah. Gives us peace because we know we're loved and we're lavished and we're his kids. Yeah, it gives us peace. Yeah. Any other thoughts? about that, uh, how he, you know, in his vocation, he stays, and helps, and he's around him. Yeah. And he said, you know, if, if this is, you know, where God puts you, it's where you, you know, you know, work out your vocation, you know, where you are, yeah. you know, and you know, have to leave, well, then you have to leave, but if this is where God puts you, that's where you should stay and be God's God. Be God's man or woman in that place, right? And so it's just wherever you are is a place where you can extend God's mercy and peace and grace, right? That, that might be something that this helps center us of, hey, where I'm at right now, how is it that I can serve God by giving grace and peace to others? You know, what does that look like? And, and Sylvia was talking about how Luther, uh, for him, that he, was, he felt called to stay and, and minister to those in the plague. And so they did. But for those that left, he encouraged them, wherever you go, extend that grace and mercy and peace too. Yeah. Um, um, Michelle uh, Penrod says it should ground us. Uh, when things uh, get crazy, we can always come back to his promises, right? We know our identity. We're grounded in Jesus, and we rely on on those promises. Uh, and then uh, Jan Sturman just said it helps us to be thankful and grateful uh, and keep that focus on God. So thanks for those comments too. All right, let's go on. Uh, Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 14. Can somebody read that for us? Yeah, go ahead, Mom. All right. So what is the inheritance that Paul is speaking of here? Eternal yeah, eternal life. Yeah, that it's, it's eternal life. It's life forever with Jesus. And, and as we think about eternal life, in some ways that began in your baptism, right? Your life forever with Jesus began there. In some ways, as Paul talks about, we've not yet taken hold of it. We've got a, we've got a guarantee. We've got it in writing, um, but we haven't yet taken full possession of that. And that's what Paul says, the Holy Spirit's that guarantee of that, that as he's with us and as he guides us, means that we're there. Yeah, Carolyn. I have a question about predestination. Yeah. A 
That's really interesting. Yeah. Let, me, let me think about that for a second. Yeah. So Carolyn's saying is asking is, okay. is predestination less about the person that's been chosen, but more about the gift that to that person. Oh, okay. I can uh, notify that. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we'll keep his name on the list. Yeah, okay. I, it's that gift. It's that gift. It's that identity. It's that seal. It's that guarantee. Um, and so, I, okay. as I just that first glance, as I'm thinking about that, I don't want to speak flippantly or just off the cuff, but uh, um, yeah, I, I'm not no, necessarily. No, no, I. We're out of sync. If that makes sense to me too, we can start with your one. Oh, it's this gift. Yeah, because see, it should have started in the spring. Is, is that um, it's it's intended to be this gift that is the seal or this guarantee that we are no longer questioning or wondering, am I loved by God? Have I done enough? Am I in with him? Am I really a son or daughter of the king? Am I an heir? You know, it's that gift. It's that guarantee which says yes to all of those questions. It, it's that gift. It's that certainty. And so it is what's given to us more than it is about us in that way or that sense yeah. ken ken and then my mom yeah or did you have a question too yeah there's there's some of that 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 goes into it too ken as we it can get uh, kind of confusing and, and trip us up a little bit when we start to try to parse some of those things out that way yeah um, but yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, go ahead, Mom. So the, the comment there is that uh, our being chosen is not about what we really receive. It's about that gifts that given to us that we can then point back to God and give back to God and, and direct others to Jesus and honor and glory that way. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yep. Right. Look at me, I was chosen, right? You know, like there must have been something special about me. You know, it's this gift. Uh, and Barbara was commenting on uh, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. So we'll get to that next week. Um, that for by grace you are saved. It's a gift, not of yourself, so that no one can boast. And so, um, that's predestination, that this election that God has given to you and to me, it's God's gift to us, not something we've earned or deserved. Yeah. Yeah. The identity is not who we are. It's our identity is found in who we are. Yeah. Very good. Um, good. Uh, let's keep going on. Can, some, uh, can somebody read for us Ephesians 1, 15 through the end of the chapter? Thanks, for, Sylvia. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the, his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and 
and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him fills everything in every way. All right. Thank you so much. As we uh, read through Ephesians at the end of the chapter, um, why does Paul give thanks for the Ephesians? For their prayers. For, for their prayers. He's remembering them in their prayers. Yeah, for their faith in the Lord um, and their love for the saints is, is kind of what he says there. Um, yeah, just to give thanks for your faith in the Lord um, and your love toward the saints in verse, verse 15. So it's this faith that God has given to them and their belief and their trust in, in Jesus no matter what, but also their love for the saints. And, and so even as they struggled, maybe at this time and even later, we saw in Revelation to share that love, Paul remembers their love for each other for the brothers, for the saints, the brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what they're talking about there. As they shared that love with each other. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that was said about the early Christians um, by non-Christians was see how they love one another, right? And, and Paul gives thanks for that, that. They cared for each other, that they carried each other's burdens, they lifted them up, that they didn't, that they made sure that those in their communities didn't have uh, needs that went unmet. Uh, so Paul gives thanks for that. And what does he still ask God for concerning the Ephesians? Spirit, wisdom, and revelation of the knowledge. of so, so more understanding, more of his spirit, more wisdom and knowledge of who God is uh, and what he's done for them. Yeah, anything else? Have the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Yeah, good. Yeah, Carolyn. Yeah, so so having your eyes your hearts enlightened, Carolyn just has kind of have a note about that just of you know that it's seen through the eyes of faith. And so instead of looking at the circumstances through the eyes of the world or the eyes of our flesh of, you know, oh man, this happened to me. Woe is me. But it's like, wait, how is God using this? How is God moving me, preparing me, preparing others, helping others through this? And it's seen through the eyes of faith, reframes what's there. And uh, Linda, I'm just going back to your comment earlier. Like, it depends on our frame of mind, how we view things, doesn't it? Um, and sometimes we, sometimes we buy into this, like, well, you just got to have a positive attitude and everything will be all right, right? But as Christians, that doesn't quite go far enough, does it? It's, we have to have the eyes of Jesus. How does Jesus see this? And that can change now my heart and my mind as I see this and help reframe my attitude, which is then the next step to that, too. Yeah, Mom? Do you have a follow-up on that? Yeah. So for your heart to be enlightened to where it can open its eyes, so you just keep being mindful of it. You know, it reminds me of that song, Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord. Yeah. I want to see you. Yeah. And I think that that is the only way we can see Jesus is when the eyes of our heart open up. So everything else aside, and what we can see, we can see what we can see. Yeah. And so the what my mom was talking about, if you couldn't hear, is that that's kind of a funny thing to think about, just the language of that. I mean, I, our, our heart doesn't have physical eyes, but when we see through our heart, we begin to see everything else a little bit more clearly. Um, we were studying the, the end of, uh, around Easter time, we were doing and walking through the Gospels and the different resurrection accounts. And it's interesting how many times people saw Jesus with their physical eyes, but it wasn't until he opened their hearts with the eyes of faith that they could actually see and believe that he was resurrected from the dead, that they could identify who he was. And that's that same idea of 
the spirit takes and changes us and gives us eyes to see Jesus. Yeah, Carolyn? And I, I think that's why then Jesus, because he gets so caught up in understanding and not taking it far enough, we can, we can say, I see, I understand, I'm fine. Yeah, so Carolyn's just saying, just, uh, sometimes the goal in Bible says to see and understand God more clearly in Scripture, and she said that's not taking it far enough, because we just not need to see with our eyes, we have to be able to see with the eyes of faith, and that only comes to the Spirit as He opens God's Word to us. Esther, the... Um... One one of my studies over Ephesians, it talked about the travel route between that part of the world and back over to China, and that that was possibly more like a port city. The river has moved miles away at this point in history, so it would. It's also a possibility of a very mixed people group of, con of the congregation. Yeah. To, to give uh, for all the saints. And they yeah. may have been travelers that got stranded there that found the, the story. Um, it it kind of sets a perspective, and we're dealing with a lot of not well treatment of each other in our country. But, um, you know, the mixture of people groups is very difficult in parts of the world. Yeah, the, and uh, Ruth, we talked a little bit about Ephesians uh, as a port city, as a crossroad city, uh, as we started. But you're right, it, it, because of that, it would have collected many different cultures and ethnicities of people uh, in the midst of that. Just in the scripture passages we looked at, we saw Priscilla and Aquila, who kind of were from Rome. We saw Paul was from Judea. We saw uh, Apollos, who was from Egypt. I mean, so all, I mean, just all of that, just in the story of scripture, we see how Ephesus collected all those people. Um, but it's yet we need the eyes of faith to see that he is the one that brings unity and makes us one in the midst of that. Um, my mom's comment just uh, right before Ruth, you were talking, just want to make sure everybody caught that, was, was the idea of just that sometimes kids are the ones that see with the eyes of faith the best. Uh, <laughs> as, as adults, sometimes we need to untrain <laughs> our cynicism or, or other things and experiences to see again with the eyes of faith like a child. Yeah. Um, what do we learn about Jesus as uh, Paul describes him? Right. I love Paul goes on like he, I talked about it in Galatians, how he just has these run on sentences. Like he gets a thought and he just jumps to the next thought and goes on, and never really finishes his sentence. Well, he does that. As soon as he talks about Jesus, he's like giving all these descriptors and, and adjectives and phrases to describe who Jesus is. How does Paul describe Jesus? Yeah. Hope in Jesus, but Jesus who worked, uh, raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He's above all rule and authority, power and dominion. He's above every name, not only in this age, but the age of come. All things are under his feet, and he's over the head. He's, he's the head of the church, right? And so Paul could have just said Jesus, and everybody knew he was talking about, but he made sure to go on of like, this is the guy who has all dominion, power, authority, who is over all. There is no one that has been like him or will ever be like him. Again, it's reminding us. Uh, these are things we know, but it's Paul's reminding these Ephesians who Jesus is. All right. So just uh, as we kind of close today, I want to just uh, have you break into your groups for a couple minutes, um, and then we'll bring us back. Um, I want you just to talk about any of these last three questions. How should we be driven to pray for others? How, as Paul did, how can we bring grace and peace to others, as Paul talked about? And, or how can our life uh, be about faith in Jesus and love towards the saints? So take any one of those questions, talk about it in your groups. I'm going to split you up online again uh, in the same way that I did before. So just talk about those three, and I'll bring you back in, in like two minutes so we can close up uh, at 1030. So. All right, getting you in the breakout rooms again. Uh, um, I'm going to recreate. So you might be in a different room than you were before, but I'm going to I'll give you those rooms again. You can go and join your rooms online there. I'll bring us back in a minute.
still doing the uh, co college care connections, even though I'm at a new church. Hey guys, Ruth might join you in a minute. I just wanted to let you know, just keep going. So keep doing that. I just wanted to say hi and good to see you guys. Good to see you, Pastor. But I send them a... We're in a breakout room. I'm bringing everybody back just for the end here to close. So, so there's a this is one of the things that allows us to do is to break into small groups. And so uh, I did that with uh, you, you stepped up for a second, so okay. But it allows us to kind of break into small groups that way. So and just have some discussion while we're discussing things here too. So I, I'm doing two things at once. You're, you're just fine, Ruth. So there's no no worries. My printer on this one didn't print. I'm getting getting copies for the next meeting. <laughs> okay. About about twenty seconds. We'll kind of come back together and and just uh, close with some thoughts and prayers here. Sorry if I cut you guys off there. You made you come back, so. <laughs> okay. So you can hang out a little afterwards if you want. So, uh, just as we close together today, uh, just this idea of uh, praying for others, uh, to to pray about what's going on in our lives, to pray for and with others, um, uh, about um, having our life be centered and grounded on and around Jesus. Uh, as we move out in love and faith so that we don't become like the Ephesians eventually struggled with about having their love grow cold. Um, but having our lives be centered around, how can I bring God's peace and his grace to bear in this situation? Uh, when you enter into a room, how can I bring it to this situation? When you enter into a conversation, how can I bring it to this person? Uh, how do we how to reorient our, our lives and our thoughts around that mission of bringing peace and grace, God's peace and grace, to all those that we encounter uh, in every conversation and in every interaction we have? So let's go ahead and close with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for guiding us, for leading us, for extending that grace and peace to us. You've done that in so many ways, Lord, through other people, through Your Word, through Your Son. 
um, those moments of grace and peace that are extended to us uh, every day. Uh, Lord, help us to be your agents, uh, to be your men and women, uh, your heirs uh, that then extend that same mission, inheritors of that mission, uh, to extend that grace and peace, your grace and peace through Jesus Christ, to others. Be with us and, and watch over us this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. I'm going to shut the recording.